The winds of autumn have come. The season of the witch is upon us. These days, we see magic as illusion and evil erased by reason. But did real witches ever really exist? By the late 1600s, many innocents had been sacrificed on the altar of fear and suspicion, and the fevered thirst for the hunting of witches was dying. But in quiet dark places, real and wicked witchery was at work, and devilish deals were made. And on one cold morning in Edinburgh, a pious pillar of the community would make a horrifying confession that would again stoke the flames of the reality of the witch. Join us on this episode of Belief Hole as we scour the deserts of the Southwest and explore the astral battlegrounds of cryptic Italian cults for true tales of cursed earth, spirit sending, and spellcraft. Conspiracy, synchronicity, Sasquatch, homunculus, alien races, Satanism in Hollywood, MK Ultra, Tartaria. There's like a whole. I've been watching this one guy. Close like, the door, in. Jeremy. In. Close your door. What's the uh, inner earth disagreements? Ghost Dad. <laughs> I like that movie. Dogman, Bohemian Grove, Corey Feldman, Magicians are demons, Specters, and Spirit spooks. summonings, Sleep Strange disappearances, Sky Whale phenomena, yes. Alternative history, Shadow people. Shh, quiet. I'm trying to say words with the mouth. It's getting dicey out there. Poltergeists. That's cool. Anunnaki. What is the moon? <laughs> Elf towers. I would never talk about it. That's old. Y2K. Cover-ups. Apocalyptic catastrophe. Vampire. Well, hello, hello. Hello, hello, gentlemen. Hi, I'm Jeremy. I'm John. And I'm Chris. And we are the brothers of the Belief Hole. Damn right. Welcome to be here. We've got a hell of a show today. Heck yeah, we do. Back in the Belief Hole studios for episode two, in a sense, of our three Halloween seasoned episodes. We got three coming out this month before Halloween. So get excited like we're excited for that. And we are breaking into that series of spookiness with what, Chris? What are you bringing to the table today? Well, witches. Well, witches. Well, comma, witches. Witches that live in the well. No, witches, because, you know, witch is the classic Halloween icon, the witch. (laughs) Witches are creepy, too. Witches are creepy, by definition. Oh, but I almost forgot. Before we get into the witchy weirdness of this episode, we have a very special announcement to make, don't we, Chris? We sure do. Mark your calendars, guys. For those of you in or around the Michigan area, this Halloween, well, this Halloween season, October 28th, two-thirds of the belief hole. I don't think John's going to be able to make it, but Chris and I will be there. Mm -hmm. In Ypsilanti, Michigan, at the Ipsy Ale House. Yes! That's right, which is a killer freaking place. It's going to be a blast. We're kind of going to be there as a meet and greet hangout in the background for the spooky Halloween events. Yeah, there's going to be a costume contest, right? There's going to be a costume contest. Uh, One of our best friends going all the way back to kindergarten, Brian, is going to be there playing with his band Head Full of Ghosts. Yes. We're super psyched about it. If you guys dig alternative music and amazing musicianship, come check it out. There's also going to be uh, some comedy. There's comedy. Yeah. Comedy on stage and maybe a face painter. Ooh. Ooh. <laughs> anyway, it's going to be an awesome time, guys. And again, Halloween contest, October 28th at a brewery in Michigan. Need I say more? It's going to be very casual. We're going to have some drinks. Uh, come up and say hi. Yeah. Little meet and greet, little hangout, little excursion from the hole. So come check it out, guys. What's the date again? October 28th at the Ipsy Ale House. We'll put some information in the show notes. So check it out. And we hope to see you guys there. Yes. It'll be weird and wild. You can finally welcome to be here. <laughs> you can finally welcome to be here. Excellent. But anyhow, back to witches, Chris. What are we going to be getting into? There's a lot to say. Yeah, yes. Uh, I was about to say, yes, witches are creepy, but there's a lot to be said about, as we've said before, and people love to talk about the persecution of witches, obviously. Oh, the... I have a little thing I wrote. Can I read it? Yeah, go ahead. Okay. It's an important point, because obviously we've all heard of the Salem Witch Trials. We know about the over-persecution and the, uh, the tragedy therein. But I wrote this little thing to try to get my thoughts out. And, it, you know, it's a little wordy. But here we go. The story of the witch is a troubled tree with ancient bloody roots. 
that branches out into a myriad of modern expressions, interpretations, and controversial histories. While the worry of the wrongly convicted witch has become effectively the only narrative we have today, see Sandwich Trials, Inquisition, etc., another reality is often forgotten. And in modernity's well-intended fight to correct the wrongs of the past, the inconvenient evidence of evil is often left buried. And those that attempt to exhume the graves of these lost stories are often cursed and accused of fear-mongering. But reality is never black and white. And as Halloween approaches, we endeavor to explore the ghoulish gray and resurrect forgotten stories of the season of the witch. Well put. In other words, there is a true dark reality to some of the history of the witch, uh, beyond just the over-persecution that we hear about. Right. Which, of course, there was that as well. But I feel like that's what history does. It tends to overcorrect sometimes, and we kind of lose sight of the more mixed reality of what happened. And of course, it's the spooky time. It's the spooky season. So why not tell some actual spooky stories? Yeah. I think the over-persecution was just a made-up story uh -huh. by modern evil people. So that they <laughs> <laughs> No, I'm, I'm kidding. I don't really know much about that persecution period of the witches, except Except like the Salem witch trials and yeah, I mean, Inquisition. There were a lot of people who were, you know, scared. I mean, the tests, obviously, if you look into like the, forget the name of the book off the top of my head, but like the witch's hammer. Malleus Malficorum, the hammer of the witches. Witch's hammer, yeah. Which was like, these are some of the tests you use to determine if someone's a witch. And it's pretty ridiculous. For example, you, if they're thrown in the jail under suspicion of being a witch, and then the familiars that might appear in the prison cell might be a rat or a fly. Or oh yeah, that, uh, things that would be in a dirty you're cell. In medieval times, exactly. And, uh, that stuff tends to exist everywhere. And if the jailer tried to kill the rat, and he was able to kill the rat, she wasn't a witch. But if the rat gets away, that's a f evil familiar spirit. Now, I mean, that's a pretty good baseline to <laughs> decide someone's life, just, right? <laughs> um, but that being said, and regardless of what you believe, if, obviously a lot of people in our audience are very open-minded to the strange things that go on in this world. Any, but even if you're not. And if you've completely just listened to the show because you are a skeptic and you like to enjoy the stories as stories, the facts are that there were people and still are out there who believe in what they're practicing as witchcraft. So regardless of whether or not there's a supernatural action that occurs when they're doing some dark things, some um, horrid things. Yeah, we're not talking about Wiccans here, right? Right. We'll probably clarify that. I'm about like dark witchcraft. We're talking about dark witchcraft and people that whether or not you believe what they do is magic still are committing crimes, evil acts against other people. Right. To gain um, power. Right. Get ahead. And that's kind of what the focus of this episode is on. It's on people who are self-admitted witches, not people who were persecuted and tortured until they confessed. People who came out and said, I did this because I believe this. And this yeah. is, you know, I've been doing this for years in secret. Real witches, real examples of dark witchcraft. Right. But I guess that's mostly the first story, because we're also going to be talking about one particular incident of someone who was using more of a folk magic. And didn't even realize the danger they were in. The sinister implications? Well, of the persecution that might occur with the sorts of magic they were doing. Because it wasn't an ad admitted pact with the devil. You'll see. It's oh, right, right. Interesting story. Is that the Southwest folk magic? Yes. And then another account is more about actually a group of people who had admitted supernatural abilities, but they were using them to battle witches. Oh. So it's just a sort of a mixture of ideas of admission of magic usage. A hodgepodge of supernatural arts yes it's going to be great but jeremy's right the first story at least we're not talking about your you know the lady who runs the art studio down the street who's a wiccan we're talking about the guy who lives on the edge of town and who only goes out at night and abducts neighborhood cats to sacrifice them by candlelight behind the save a lot no oh, nasty fella men can be witches oh yeah you knew that right i didn't yeah i don't i don't like that <laughs> John says no men. Don't witches. they should have another name? Don't Warlocks, they should have, don't they, don't they should have one? <laughs> don't they should have another name? Welcome I mean, to be we here. Warlock. Warlock is a, a common term for male witch. Although I guess some people say that warlock is a derogatory term. Uh, that its derivation has to do with uh, a negative connotation to witches, male witches in particular, or something about oath breaking. But huh? Yeah. But you can still just be called a witch if you're a dude. Mm. A, deuter, a deuter witch mm, doesn't sit right with me. Like an actress. An actress can be called an actress or an actor. That's true. Right? Or an acting person. An so acting I don't, person. I don't like it at all. Call him a warlock. All right, we'll, keep, we'll, <laughs> we'll do that for you. John has laid the rules down. <laughs> it's yeah. just confusing to me. 
we'll keep it. We'll say the male witch or the, there you go. the he witch. <laughs> he witch. <laughs> <laughs> that is a good point, though, about people that may practice dark things to get ahead throughout history. We have examples of that. It's not like that's, you know, uh, made up nonsense. Think about like just even using throughout history, like blood or the blood of children to increase your lifespan that, you know, royals have done. Like Elizabeth Bathory, a let people allege that it's still going on. Yeah. Uh, cannibalism, yeah, doing dark things to gain power. We, even things that as basic as like weird old medicine, like we used to drink, it used to be thought that if you drank from a skull cap, a human skull, it could cure epilepsy. That doesn't work. Things like that that involve cannibalism or consuming the life force or from the body of another human can give you certain benefits. And, you know, whether it's considered old dark medicine or witchcraft or midwifery or whatever you want to call it, people thought there's something to it and some people still do. And so some people did practice these things. I guess that's the point. Yeah. Whether or not you believe they were in consort with the actual devil. Right. And I guess this is a good time to say, as any, that uh, this will be an episode of intrigue and adventure, obviously. But there will be some dark conversations from time to time and yes. a little gruesome here and there, but nothing over the top. We're not going to be too graphic, what I'm trying to say. But, you know, a little too scary for the kiddos, potentially, certain aspects of the show. So so listen once alone and then listen again with your children. <laughs> Get us those double downloads. Yeah, so some things you can look forward to coming up on this episode. I've got admitted warlocks with self-aware staffs. <laughs> Southwest sorcerer prison breaks. and astral cult witch battles of Italy. Ooh. What was the second one? Uh, Southwest Sorcerer Prison Breaks. <laughs> so many ideas in that. My brain could not put together an image of what that is. Well, it's just a clue. Okay, sorcerers breaking out of prison in the Southwest. Okay, got mm -hmm. it. Yes, but I'm really excited about these stories. I hunted high and low for some really unique stories that have some pretty compelling, not only aspects when it comes to the metaphysical things in relationship to what we're talking about, but also the scene, the setting, and the uh, adventure in some of them. So, um, Okay, great. Before we get into it, what's coming up in the expansion for members? Well, I'm not going to get into it too much right now. I'm just going to say, basically choose your own adventure, Freemasonic werewolves. Ooh, that's a little taste. A deep dark reality within secret sects of Freemasonry, these clandestine groups where people are allegedly being tapped into the role of the werewolf or the vampire. Awesome. Uh, we're also going to get into some werewolf, great werewolf stories from Sabine Baring Gold's The Book of Werewolves, which is a classic. Oh, okay. So their first part's not from that book. No, so there was, I found, when reading that book, I found a clue. Do you guys remember uh, Bill Snow, Snowbillman? Snowbillman? Snowbillman. <laughs> Do you remember the Snowbillman? <laughs> no. The Snowbillman. No, this was a guy who we did that uh, expansion episode about the 3,500-year-old vampire. Oh, the admitted vampire guy? From Florida? Yeah. This was the, the guy in that episode who claimed to be a vampire, and he talks about how he was essentially a Freemason. And inside the Freemasonic lodges, there is an infiltrating force of vampires and allegedly werewolves that you may be tapped once in there to join these ranks. It's a crazy story. We mentioned that in a previous episode, but I'm going to dive into that because I found a clue in this, this book from like the 1800s where a story connects that exact thing. So I think it's an interesting piece of evidence and it launched me off a fascinating journey. Do you think George that. Bush Jr. is a werewolf? Yes. George Bush Jr. George Bush What's Jr. that other George guy w? in Skull and Bones? Uh, oh, uh, Carrie. John Kerry? John Kerry. Yeah, he's absolutely a werewolf. I think he's admitted it. I think he's... He's more vampire, <laughs> I would say. But what yeah, about Donald Rumsfeld? Donald Rumsfeld. Reptile. He's a hybrid. He's... Reptilian? Reptilian witch. <laughs> Wait, was it Louis C.K.? Yeah. Who, uh, was it Open Anthony or something? I'm trying to get him to admit that he was a reptilian yeah. person. Yeah, I don't absolutely. understand. Why did we gotta he drop just... that clip. <laughs> yeah, so good. Why can't he just... I mean, it's not a problem. If, he, if he's not, he can just say <laughs> it. It's like, I've just heard it a lot from a lot of different places. It's like, fine. Yeah. I can't remember what he exactly said. He's basically said, saying he like, says. just, to, you know, you can say that you're not. And, and whoever, whoever the host was, was like, he's not gonna, he doesn't have to respond to that. I don't know if anybody's ever asked you directly, sir, but are you, are you a lizard? <laughs> I don't think <laughs> are you actually can you just please give that a straight answer? <laughs> Let him answer. 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 Are you a lizard? Here's the short answer. Yeah. I'm in New York City. 
I walk down the street, people walk up, shake hands, stop me, they want an autograph, want to get a photograph with me, <laughs> go to eat last uh -huh. night at dinner, and Joyce and I were sitting there in the little Italian restaurant, <laughs> and, and a man came he up and said he'd like to buy my dinner, and it turns out I paid for my dinner, the next thing I know, the waiter comes back and said, the man insisted to pay for your dinner, uh -huh. and here's your canceled receipt for oh. paying. That, but he, <laughs> you didn't answer the question. <laughs> He's not going to dignify an answer he, to, are you a lizard, he, Louis? He why not? Just because tell me he's no. not a lizard. What is the story about somebody paid for your dinner? Have to, I would pay because for a lizard's he, dinner. I, I think I, I understood the fact that there are people out there that appreciate what he's done no, as, a totally. as a leader. And, there and, is plenty of evidence that this guy is a well-decorated and yes. appreciated American. Exactly. But I just want to know if he's a lizard. He's <laughs> that was pretty funny, yeah. yeah. All right, let's get into our first story. A somewhat obscure, uh, but a very classic tale. And this is a tale of a wolf in sheep's clothing, and the horrid deeds of a pillar of a community, suspected by no one, but shocked by all. This is the story of Major Thomas Weir, the Edinburgh man who admitted to witchcraft. And for this story, I gathered a couple sources and kind of melded them together to tell this tale. One was from the Encyclopedia of Witches, Witchcraft and Wicca by Rosemary Ellen Guiley. Great book. And one was an article from The Scotsman. So this story starts in the late 1600s, and the witch hunts and subsequent trials had waned in recent years. But some of the most intriguing tales come from this period of waning fear and persecution. So let us begin. While most of the witches who were tried and executed were brought to the attention of the Kirk Sessions following accusations made by neighbors or relatives, and most of the confessions resulted from questioning and sometimes physical pressure, Major Weir's confession was entirely voluntary, unprompted, and given his reputation in the part of Edinburgh where he lived, completely unexpected. At the time of his confession in 1670, Major Weir was living in a rented house in West Bow. He shared his house with his unmarried sister, Grizzle. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect name. He was a retired soldier, fiercely anti-Catholic and anti-royalist, and was described as a serious man of grim countenance, always dressed in black. Wherever he went, he carried a black staff. A member of a strict Presbyterian sect, he seemed to live a particularly pious life and was held in high esteem by other members of the church. He held frequent prayer meetings in his own home, leading the prayers with a fervor that was quite inspirational. He appears to have been a figure who was held in considerable awe in the community. It was only after his own confession that stories about strange behavior of the good major started to reach the ears of the authorities. Weir's confession came out of the blue. He was attending a religious service when he suddenly stood up and started to accuse himself of being in the service of the devil. Excuse me, everyone. I need to be clear about something. I am in the service and under the order of the devil himself. The first reaction of the other members of the congregation was disbelief. The major was clearly quite ill. Something had caused him to lose his senses. Angelic Thomas, as he was known amongst them, was raving like a madman. He's in control of me. Yes, he Members is. of the church tried to reason with him to calm him down, but Weir was implacable. Weir persisted with his claims, and medical service was sought. Doctors declared him to be mentally disturbed. The authorities were initially very reluctant to prosecute him. However, he remained absolutely insistent that he was guilty of terrible sins, for which he was not seeking any sort of pardon. He confessed to having long practiced black magic and owned a black magic staff. His chief crime was incest with his sister, he had also committed sodomy with various animals, including sheep, cows, and his mare, and at length he was imprisoned in the toll booth while further investigations were made. While in prison, Weir cursed the doctors, who tried to help him, and said, I know my sentence of damnation is already sealed in heaven, for I find nothing within me but blackness and darkness, brimstone and burning to the bottom of hell. Okay, so this is where it gets even crazier. So no one's believing these claims, but the investigators come to his sister 
hoping that she's going to clear all this up. But her response is unexpected. Much to the surprise of all concerned, Weir's sister, Grizzle, corroborated her brother's stories and was arrested as well. Major Weir's black staff was taken from him, for Weir and his sister claimed that he had been given it by none other than the devil himself, and it was an instrument of terrible power. Grizzle's confession had transformed her into Grizzle the Necromancer. Grizzle proudly showed off a mark on her forehead in the shape of a horseshoe, which appeared when she frowned. It was the mark given to her by the devil, she said. She confessed that much of what she and Thomas knew had been learned from their mother, who had been a witch. She also told of a dark stranger taking herself and the major to Dalkeith in a fiery coach. So crazy story so far. Weird. Um, gross story. I don't, I mean, so like, I mean. What's the biggest crime The here? crime just seems like gross having stuff. sex with animals. <laughs> and his sister? Is there any like, like murder? Why don't we wait and see? Okay, sorry. So they have to put him on trial, right? Because he's claiming all these terrible things that you're not allowed to do. Uh, you know, sex with animals and such. Or with your sister. And they have no alternative but to take them to trial. But rather than charge him with witchcraft, they charge him with unnatural sexual practices. Even though he's claiming that he's been in league with the devil. Because the idea is... He's such a pillar of the community, right? And the church wanted to save face because he was a, me- a member of theirs. You know, he was a, a leader in the church. So throughout the trial, Weir and his sister, they, they remain unrepentant. Uh, and because of this, really, they have to come up with a guilty verdict. They're unrepentant. So why did they confess? That's a, que- that's a great question. We don't know. Um, some of the arguments are that he was ill and mad. But the odd thing about the situation was that his sister confirmed these al- same allegations unprompted. And uh, well, let's continue on. Sure. So in the end, Weir was convicted of adultery because he was married, by the way. Adultery, incest. One count of fornication and one count of bestiality. And for his sentence, he was condemned to be strangled at the stake between Edinburgh and Leith on Monday, April 11th, 1670, and his body burned to ashes. Harsh. Pretty, yeah, pretty intense. And the death was a gruesome one. John, we continue. As the rope was tightened around his neck, the major is said to have refused to ask for God's mercy. His staff was thrown into the flames beside its master. Both are said to have taken an exceptionally long time to burn, and witnesses claim to have seen the staff twisting and jumping as the flames crackled around it. Grizzle's hanging was no less dramatic. As preparations were made to end her life on the scaffold, she tried desperately to remove all her clothes in front of the assembled crowds in a last defiant affront to decency. After the initial shock of the arrests and executions had died down, more stories began to spread about Thomas and Grizzle's life. People who lived in the area of Westbow, where their brother and sister had stayed, said there had been some strange goings on at their house. There were lights and noises in the building at odd hours in the night. The figure of a female, twice the height of a normal woman, appearing outside, laughing maniacally, (laughs) and terrifying passersby, torch-bearing fiends shrieking and roaring in the streets nearby. Yeah, crazy story. Uh, when it comes to what other like magic-y kind of things was he? I thought the staff, didn't the staff have special abilities? Yeah, the or? staff was said to walk alongside him at night by its own accord. Ah. The top of the staff had like a, a human head carving. Oh. Like it was carved as a human head. And uh, apparently it could uh, run errands for him, allegedly. I mean, there's other <laughs> things. <laughs> there's other things. But yeah, obviously most of it seems to be just indecent, gross stuff. And really? just the, just the admitted... Uh, Packed with the devil that he and his uh, sister, yeah, sister lover had made. Yes, question. Uh, okay, so I thought that this guy, I thought they found like bones or bodies of children, like dark stuff. Not with Major Weir, huh? He's just kind of a gross guy. Mm-hmm. That, wow. It seems oh, there might like, be. I don't know. I I didn't find any in this my. Is a bad example of a real witch, Chris. <laughs> I mean, it was. Uh, I was drawn to it because it was admitted, un- unprovoked confession. Mm-hmm. But um, again, could have been crazy. His sister. They both could have. Who knows? Had yeah. some weird mold infection in their house and had a shared 
hallucination. Yeah. It or... was interesting that she said that what they had learned came from their mother. Oh, yeah. I thought that was just kind of an interesting, it was kind of uh, mentioned as sort of a, like a side comment mm -hmm. in my research, but it was an interesting thing to consider. It would make sense why, if true, they were able to hide it for so long because they had grown up with this secret. Right. You know, and had learned probably the deception from and their mom. to keep it quiet. It's also interesting. You hear a lot about these kind of dark paths into the uh, actual satanic rites, people that believe uh, the idea of devil worship, uh, that they are often also involved in the church, right? You have, because you have the black mass, which is a mockery of the mass, the Catholic mass, right? Mm. So it's interesting here too, that it would be someone in the church, a leader in the church who also secretly has been living this double life. It's just kind of an interesting parallel to what you've heard in other cases, yeah. in modern day cases, for those that believe in this kind of devil worship going on. Yeah, it's interesting. And the one uh, little anecdote that I also found very colorful and entertaining was the the fascinating side note about the woman twice the size of a human woman. Yeah, what was, was that seen about? standing outside his home, a giantess, on occasion, cackling and left. Just, uh, just an interesting, kind of terrifying little uh, visual. Yeah, but again, these are you know, there's only so much information from this time, so it's hard to go to deep detail research. It's, a lot of it is written from uh, letters that people sent to other people uh, at the time period, that sort of thing, where we have a lot of this information. Also, of course, uh, the news, the rumor mill. Um, yeah, always rumor mill. But regardless, uh, what he did to those animals, I would say, is pretty evil and dark. Yeah, for sure. I mean, that's, you know. Can't get consent with a horse. You can't, unless you're a horse whisperer, in which case it's between you and him. <laughs> so is this like a well-known urban legend over there? I mean, is, is his house still? Well, yeah, it's not an urban legend. It's, it is fact. At least the, the court proceedings happen and the testimony is recorded. This is interesting. I found this recent update, actually, about Thomas Weir and his home which was uh, famously haunted after this. And this comes from both the Fordian Times and the Daily Mail. I kind of looked at both sources for this. So years after, people had believed Weir's notorious home had been destroyed, but as I said recently, the discoveries were made that changes this conclusion. This article is called Neighbors from Hell. Remains of Wizard's House of Horrors are found hidden inside a Quaker meeting place. Thrilling. Thomas and Grizzle Weir's crimes were so awful that they were executed in their house, thought to be teeming with evil spirits, was abandoned and left to decay for centuries before being knocked down. The Weirs were executed in 1670 after admitting to shocking crimes, including bestiality, incest, and necromancy. According to folklore, their house said to what be- What is necromancy? Uh, raising the dead. So there's a good witchy thing for you yeah, that they were accused of. I didn't hear that in the first yes, story. I didn't get everything from every Oh, article. you didn't get the best bits of witchery? <laughs> we got it's the... Raising the dead? Mm -hmm. Yeah, necromancy. Is that so th that could happen? <laughs> it happens all the time. <laughs> Have you heard of witchcraft, John? <laughs> I mean, was that like, obviously they thought that, like, I don't even understand yeah, yeah, that yeah, part. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Through magical rites or ritual ceremony, you can raise the dead. The proof of the people that were walking around. I mean, right. as much as we have proof today, it's You've all. You've heard of Dr. Frankenstein. He was successful. That's not, he's not a necromancer. He didn't do it through spiritual action. He did it through That's electricity. <laughs> That's right. Yeah, it was also, that was also a, a fictional book. Yeah, but based on uh, ideas at the time. Yes. Okay, sorry, go ahead. Yes, but necromancers are people who practice black magic who focus in raising the dead. Uh, which you can find in many countries, right? Mm. Yeah, in many video games as well. We have the zombie in Africa. Mm-hmm. All right, we shall continue. Good question, though. Yes. According to folklore, their house, said to be the capital's most haunted home, then stood empty before being demolished in the 19th century. But researchers have discovered that the builders of a church, now the Quaker Meeting House in Victoria Terrace, actually incorporated the old dwelling into the structure. Historian Dr. Jan Bondison of Cardiff University said, quote, Major Weir's house in the West Bow was recognized as the most haunted in Edinburgh. Although no person dared live there, its windows were lit up at night with weird shapes flitting past the dirty panes and strange music coming from inside. But contrary to local belief, it still stands today. After the Major's death, people spoke of hearing his coach and horses thundering down the road while it was claimed his staff, which was burned with his body, was seen floating along the street searching for its master. 
The house was eventually bought in 1780 by an ex-soldier and his wife, who were said to have fled on their first night after seeing the form of a calf appear in their bed. A cow? Imagine that. I'm pretty horrifying. Oh, no, yeah, calf. Kidding. Baby cow. <laughs> that's creepy, uh, though. Yeah, that's creepy. In his letters on demonology and witchcraft, written in 1830, Sir Walter Scott noted, quote, It is certain that no story of witchcraft or necromancy, so many of which occurred near and in Edinburgh, made such a lasting impression on the public as that of Major Weir. The remains of the house in which he and his sister lived are still shown at the head of the West Bow, which has a gloomy aspect, well suited for a necromancer. At the time I am writing, this last fortress of superstitious renown is in the course of being destroyed. But as it turns out, the property has been used by the Quaker religious community for around 25 years. Anthony Buxton, manager of the Quaker Meeting House said, quote, This was the first time I had been told Major Weir's home was actually here. I thought it had been demolished by people who didn't want anything to do with it. That said, one of my staff some years ago said he had seen Weir walk through the wall. If Dr. Bonnison is right, Weir's house is in our toilet, which seems appropriate. I just like that at the end. Because he's a poopy head. Because he's a dirty man. Um, <laughs> he said that very seriously. Because <laughs> he's a dirty man. Anyway, I just thought that was interesting. This you know, famously haunted property everybody thought was gone. They find out centuries later had been incorporated into a building that the Quakers had been using. Yeah. I like that. It's a pretty good clue that you didn't know that, but someone said they keep seeing the ghost of Weir. In the bathroom? Then again, how would they know what Weir looked like? I guess a, a guy in an old black robe with a staff would be a pretty good clue. If you knew he lived in the area in the that's, past. That's true. Interesting stuff. Anyways, sorry. Apparently that was not as magical, magically exciting for you guys as I thought it would be. It's kind of disturbing. Well, yeah. It's kind of gross. It's a lot of the stories of witchcraft are disturbing and gross. The real ones anyway. Make sure you really work the sound design in for those uh, animal, <laughs> animal moments. <laughs> the intimate animal moments. In respect to the animals. Yeah. That is a... Uh, but I did like the aspect of the story that is magical staffs, because that's pretty fun, right? That's the thing. Oh, yeah, I would have focused on that. Well, there are more stories about his staff. Uh, if you want to look them oh, up, feel the free. Oh, cool stories <laughs> yeah, about a magical the ones staff. that don't involve animal sex. <laughs> <laughs> well, who knows what he did with that staff. Um, um, but how cool would it be? How cool <laughs> would it be to have a magical staff? I mean, not a demonic magical staff, but like a good magical staff. And you could be like, soundproof this room. Like a Harry Potter one where you got to say like weird words that sound like the words, but they're kind of different. Sure. Like soundproofio manufio. <laughs> yeah, but less lame. Uh, anyways, I think that would be cool. I just wanted to bring that up. You just said because you're a Hufflepuff. Uh, don't know, Jeremy. John, which Harry Potter house are you? <laughs> I don't know anything about Harry Potter because I'm a normal person. That makes you a Slytherin. All I know is that the music's good. Anyways, I'd love to one day do an episode. Maybe not a whole episode because you'd run out pretty quick, but Magic Staffs. And the stories around magic staffs. I think there's enough out there just on magic staffs. Well, you've, I've looked it up. You've got uh, the religious sort of magic staffs. Like, well, you remember St. Patrick hid the staff, helped get snakes oh, out of places. Oh, yeah. Moses' staff was pretty magical. His brother Aaron's staff was also pretty magical. Then you have more cultic staffs like Druid's staffs, Merlin's staff, if you know how much you believe he was an actual historical figure. Now, can a staff double as a cane? Absolutely. They're versatile instruments, really. Can it be used to conduct music? Wands can. It would be a little uh, impractical because of the size, but yeah, wands, true. magical yeah, wands I keep thinking be. of that, what was that Disney movie, Fantasia? Fantasia? Remember where they make the brooms and the mm -hmm. mop buckets dance? Yeah, wands are, more, are smaller, right? Yeah, they're a little more portable, Yeah, more practical and pointed. Unless you need help walking, then you want to go staff. Do, do the staffs have more power than the wands? Just because of their size? More surface area? You would imagine they yeah, would. They, yeah, they're, they're more for like parting seas. Yeah, and yeah, yeah. The magic <laughs> to surface area ratio, I think, is pretty yeah, important. The wands are probably more like, oh. Bring me my overcoat. Yeah. <laughs> and are pressing people at like dinner party, <laughs> making a napkin dance. Cool. I mean, the, the real nerd in me would love to do an episode of like, you know, magical instruments and the differences between like wands in this region compared to wands in this part of the world. Well, there's some interesting lore. I know behind the, uh, the wand, for instance, going back to like pagan rituals and magic. Can you bring up the Hollywood thing? Of course, the Hollywood, the Hollywood tree that wands were supposed to be historically made from mm -hmm. the idea of Disney magic and magic of Hollywood, the magic of film and the idea of casting a spell yeah. with the Hollywood 
wand and right. Hollywood itself. Yeah, there's, I mean, people have gone into that. It's a really fascinating direction. When it comes to like spell casting and Disney and media and Hollywood, it's interesting you brought up spell because we've talked about this before, but how spell comes from, you know, like spelling out things. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right. So this is incorporated into our next tale here. Okay, so to set up this next story, the dark shadows of the Inquisition were cast far beyond the shores of Europe, as you know, and the New World was not immune to its contemptuous hunt. So let us, sorry, I didn't mean to. <laughs> Did I was going to read. I was going to read all this, but yeah, I wrote this out. <laughs> it sounds pretty lame now that I read it out loud. That yeah, was great. Uh, so let us set sail from the dismal shores of the burning times in Europe and venture into the deserts of the American colonial Southwest to explore a strange tale of possible witchery involving prison escapes, invincibility spells, and little pieces of paper. I want to go on a contemptuous hunt. All right, so this story <laughs> is called The Sorcerer's Escape in the Southwest. That's what I've called it anyway. This comes to us from The Encyclopedia of Witches by Rosemary Ellen Guiley and The Hornado del Muerto Trail, Dead Man's Journey from Desert USA. So these two sources I've kind of cobbled together for this story. Okay. Headed southward toward Mexico in the summer of 1670, over a trail through a foreboding desert landscape, bounded by dark and sullen mountains to the east and west, a party of five traders made a grim discovery. Later, one of the traders, Francisco del Castillo Patancar, would say in a letter to a friend that they had found, quote, A roan horse tied to a tree by a halter. It was dead, and near it was a doublet, a short waist jacket, and coat of blue cloth lined with otter skin. There was also a pair of trousers of the same material and other remnants of clothing that had decayed. Searching the area, the party soon found Quote, Hair in the remnants of clothing, I and my companions found in very widely separated places the skull, three ribs, two long bones, and two other little bones which had been gnawed by animals. Okay, so now let's take a moment to travel back in time just two years when this story really begins. A time when a German trader with fine goods and a mysterious background is traveling across the desert through miles and miles of dangerous Apache territory. In 1668, a man named Bernardo Gruber made his way northward, likely following the trail through the foreboding desert landscape. Accompanied by three Apache servants, he led a pack train that included 10 pack mules, 18 horses, and three oxen. He arrived in New Mexico bearing fine goods to trade. It was said that he was fearless and traveled through the lands of the fierce Apache without harm. Perhaps it was his ability to avoid Apache attacks that led to his downfall. Apparently, Gruber carried on his business routinely until Christmas morning of 1668. For some strange reason, during mass that morning, at the Quarry Mission Church, Nuestra Señora de la Purísima Concepción, Gruber and a friend, Juan Martín Serrano, climbed the ladder to the choir loft. As mass proceeded, Gruber took several small pieces of paper from his pocket, and he and Martin wrote on 11 of them mysterious letter combinations, separated and bracketed by crosses. Cross ABNA, cross ADNA, cross. Gruber whispered to the choir members, quote, He who eats one of these slips of paper will, from that hour of this first day to that same hour of the second day, be free from any harm, whether it be caused by knife or shot. The effect would only last, said Gruber, through the first day of Christmas. Gruber gave a couple of the marked pieces of paper to Juan Nieto, a 19-year-old who indicated that he wanted to be, quote, free from any harm. Gruber reportedly claimed that this spell was undertaken whenever Germany went to war. Gruber probably did not know that within the hour after the mass, young Nieto would stand within a Pueblo ceremonial chamber, or Kiva, before a group of curious Indian men. He swallowed one of the pieces of paper. He then stabbed his hand and wrist with an awl, and to the amazement of the spectators, he suffered no injury. Soon after, several Pueblo Indians betrayed him to a priest for possessing sorcery skills that would make him invulnerable. Summoned to appear before church authorities, Gruber readily admitted that he did indeed possess such a spell, and he wrote it down. Cross, A-B-N-A, 
cross, A-D-N-A, cross. Upon this confession and evidence, the church arrested Gruber, and he was put in irons in the Pueblo mission at Abo. While in jail, he talked freely of other magical things he had learned in Germany, evidently unaware of how folk magic was regarded by the Catholic Church authorities in New Mexico. His admissions only solidified the case against him as a sorcerer. The authorities intended to transfer Gruber to the Inquisition in Mexico City. But before this could happen, Gruber's servants sneaked into the mission and pried open the bars of his cell so that he could escape. Gruber remained at large for several weeks. Then one day, Captain Andres de Peralta made an odd discovery on a desert road in southern New Mexico. A dead roan horse was tied to a tree. Near the carcass were a blue cloth coat lined with otter skin and a pair of blue breeches, both severely decayed. The captain recognized the distinctive clothing as items worn by Gruber. He searched the area and found Gruber's hair and several of his bones, all widely scattered. The skull, three ribs, two long bones, and two small bones. It was assumed that Gruber had been killed by Indians, giving the case a bizarre twist. In the end, it seemed that his sorcery had failed him. Discuss thoughts? Uh, so the key in that story is that we have this spell of invincibility. Yeah, essentially, right? And I've actually heard this, this letter combination in that book, the Encyclopedia of Witchcraft and Witchery or whatever it's called from Rosemary Ellen Guiley. Link in the show notes. A fantastic book, by the way. Great uh, appendix of that stuff. I've seen that spelling or a spelling like that used. I think uh, maybe Marie Laveau mm. had something like that. But there is something to this idea of certain letters and orders, whether they represent something. Do we know what these letters are supposed to mean? This cross A, B, N, A, cross A, D, N, A, cross. When I read this, because it looks like a plus button to me on a remote control, <laughs> like I just kept thinking for... of like Nintendo cheat codes. It doesn't look like that. Like yes. It's A, B, B, D, C, or wait, not that, but A, B, whatever. A, B, N. There's no N button though on the Nintendo. I just thought that was kind of funny because that is like a cheat code now. Yeah. So I thought that when you tease the story earlier, I thought that there was going to be, that the escape was also due to his magic. Oh, magical? Yeah. Nah. I mean, they bent I think the, the I think the bars are made of wood. But they bent the bars. Well, depending on the on the reading you read, I also read mm. that he worked himself to kind of work on the removal of the bars over a period of months. <laughs> uh, months he was I there. Did, well, I did, well, he was held for a long time, but he was able to get the guards alone and convince them that he was ill or something, and then was able to make his escape. But I felt bad for him, because at the end of the day, this guy, it sounds like he wasn't a witch necessarily. He, he practiced folk magic. Yeah, And from his, wherever he was in Germany, it was like, oh, use these letters and then you eat these and then you're safe. You know, you're protected by God on Christmas if you want to yeah. go to war. It's like a <laughs> nice, like, lucky party favor. He wasn't hurting anybody else, I guess yeah. I'm trying to say. So I felt, felt bad for him. But it is interesting. I did think that just the, the vision of that, of where he comes in through this dangerous Apache territory with a long train of animals and like no security, but somehow makes it here, I think was one of the reasons why people are like, Oh, maybe his invincibility spell did work for him. Yeah. Although he was traveling not on Christmas, so I don't know. I mean, the, obviously it worked for the, uh, was it the Pueblo kid? Yeah. Who, him, who later he claimed he was joking because he, oh, he really? tried to help him escape later. This story is getting thinner and thinner. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think he felt bad. He tried to help him get out of jail later. Regardless, I'm going to swallow one of these letters later today and then give it a try. Hit myself with a hammer. Um, well, again, okay. Two for two. Striking out here. <laughs> this last one is going to blow your mind. I think it's O for two, Chris. Let's take a break. When we get back, we're going to tell the best story you've ever heard in relation to witches and uh, Italian cults and astral battles. I mean, I doubt you've heard a story like that. This is pretty incredible. Yeah, guys. And we're about to play an expansion clip of this week's members only episode. If you want to get these episodes, go to believehole.com, click on the big red, join the expansion button and join us there for episodes that are equally well produced and just as righteous. We are working on getting a Discord going for expansion members as well. Yes. So that will be an extra perk, which is going to be really cool. I'm pretty excited about it. Yeah, it's been a long time coming. So we should have a lot more engagement interaction over there, and we will be able to have a lot of free-flowing ideas and thoughts about all the subjects that we talk about, and it'll be fun. Yeah, so it's a cozy place for you to come and dive in and chat with other Bleeflings and give ideas. And, and thanks to Uncle Slommer for helping us get that going. Yeah. All right, without further ado, here is a clip from this week's Members Only Expansion episode. Access granted. 
Only high-level Satanists are gifted with this anointing. Uh, you, you can't, it's not like in the movies where if you are bitten by a werewolf, you become a werewolf. It's not that simple at all. In fact, you don't want to know how you become a werewolf. It's not fit for innocent ears, but it's, it's so horrifying and depraved, I don't even want to go into it. You see, in the Brotherhood, there are 10 degrees. Like, you know, first degree, second degree, third degree. These are grades of achievement. And when you get up to seventh degree, you become what is called an adeptus exemptus, which means you're an adept, at least someone who's very good at doing something, and exempt means you're beyond morality. You're exempt from good and evil at that point. That sounds fun. You become <laughs> a embryonic god in human form. And at this point, there is a fork you have to take in the road in this particular flavor of Satanism that I was in. One way is to become a vampire, one way is to become a werewolf. I chose the way to become a vampire because I thought it was sexier somehow, and I'd heard that becoming a werewolf was extremely painful. And indeed it is. You can hear the bones crack. had a safe trip around the neighborhood on your broomstick and have returned safely. Before we get into this next part, why don't you tell our beloved fans about the new channel we're creating? Yes, I'm very excited to announce this. We've been talking about doing this for a while. If you are familiar with us on YouTube, you know that we have these wonderful animations that we create for the episodes, and a lot of people have commented that they just love having them on in the background. So it's like a visual ambiance. Yes, and uh, we here in the whole are big fans of uh, ambience, background ambience, when we're researching uh, just hanging out. And so what we've decided to do is build a channel using our animations from the show with tweaks here and there and create sonic landscapes for you with uh, wonderful visuals. So there'll be like a combination of music, some background sound effects, but be very cool to have on in the background while you're yeah. studying or working or whatever. You want to set that Halloween mood. Absolutely. Yeah. You can have Halloween year round. It's right. Yeah, it's going to be sort of a, a paranormal mysteries ambience channel, basically. Exactly. Something that we are constantly looking for when we're doing our own dives into the strange. Yeah, to set the mood. Researching the show. So next time you are in between Beliefful episodes, and you, but you want to stay in the hole, put on an ambience from the... Uh, oh, yes. The name is Dark Mountain. Mystery and Paranormal Ambience. So go over there, subscribe to the channel, and just play our first video. The first one's actually going to be cool retro music. So it's going to have the vibe of the show already, so it'll be really cool. Yeah, a lot of music you've heard on episodes and a lot of people have asked about. What songs are these? Yes, we will be doing playlists of that stuff too. So if you're a fan of the music on the show, then you're going to love this channel. Exactly. So check out the show notes from this episode, whether on YouTube or on your podcast app, and click the link and subscribe. And what's the name again, Chris? Again, that's Dark Mountain. Mystery and paranormal ambience. It's basically, it's named after a mysterious hill that we used to ride bikes up when we were kids. That's why the logo you made yeah. has a, like a kid on a bike behind this like dark, mysterious scene. So it just kind of has like some nostalgia to it, which fits with the show and, you know. Yeah, I want a sort of a strange vibe with youthful mystery and uh, a little bit of magic. Kind of like the show. Mm -hmm. Exactly, yeah. So I want it to be a mirror of that. But uh, check it out, guys. You're going to love it. Can't go wrong with more hole. Speaking of the hole, let's get back in there. Let's do it. All right, we're coming back in with a fantastic story. As I've promised, the home run of the evening, I think, the magical home run. This is the story of the Ben and Dottie, which I'm sure neither of you have heard of, right? I have now. So this chapter in witchcraft in Europe connects to episodes we've done before in the past. Uh, and you'll see why. And there's a very specific part, John, that I'm going to point out to you because it relates to you personally. But let's go back in time to the late 1500s uh, and explore this fascinating, somewhat obscure chapter 
uh, of witchery. It's a tale that involves astral battle between an obscure Italian cult and their sworn enemy sorcerers. Okay, so to set this up, the Benendati, they were participants in the lingering remnants of an ancient agrarian cult in northern Italy, which came to the attention of the Inquisition in the late 16th century because of the cult's nocturnal battles with witches and warlocks over the fertility of the crops and livestock. The term Benendati means good walkers. The cult flourished in the Friuli region of Italy, an isolated area where Italian, German, and Slavic traditions met and mingled. The Benendati were comprised of men and women born of the call. Does that sound familiar? Oh, the call. That's yeah. what Steve Stockton's got, right? Right. That is the inner fetal membrane still covering the body, especially the head. Well, I didn't mean that Steve Stockton has that now. No, but this, but they did. They would keep it, the Benendati. They really? would keep their, some of them would, they would keep their call and they would wear it around their neck as magical talismans. Anyway, that call, much like in Appalachian magic traditions, that call was a sign of not only the Benendati being able to heal people, who were bewitched by witches, but also gave them the ability to see witches. Interesting. And this is the key to the Benendati, because this basically makes them supernatural witch hunters. And you can see why this might get a little sticky down the road when it comes to the Inquisition, because the line between being a witch and being a supernatural witch finder <laughs> seems pretty close. <laughs> yeah, you know? you're all dancing in the same uh, graveyard there. Exactly. Colorful analogy. So as I said, some Benedatti save their calls, which is kind of gross, but at the time, well, you know, maybe um, pretty important mm -hmm. if you want to have those powers. The Benedatti claimed to be compelled to serve their villages. So they were the good guys, right, during the Ember Days where the witches were being burned. Some innocent for sure. The Ember Days. The Ember Days. In, uh, I think, Wiccan tradition, that's what you refer to as the time of persecution. Oh, really? Yeah, but it's also a solstice thing. For... It's a pretty way to say it. Anyway, they claimed that it was the changing of the seasons marked by the solstice and the equinoxes. At midnight, they were summoned, sometimes by drums. Tradition has it by angels. And if they did not respond promptly and were late, they were severely beaten. And they were summoned to do what, you might ask? Well, to travel outside their body and have battles in the inner earth with witches, wizards, and warlocks. Whoa. Yeah. Yeah, and this is what's fascinating to me, is this ties into something that wasn't talked about much back then, even in supernatural circles, even in occult circles, was astral travel. But the Benendati were known for this. The Benendati, the ones who had the sight, who were born of the call. So the Benendati, they leave their bodies, and their spirits assume the shapes of butterflies, mice, cats, and hares. So kind of shamanistic there. Uh, they went to the Valley of Josephat in the center of the world, where they met the army of witches and warlocks who were also in spirit guises. The Ben and Dottie would be armed with stocks of fennel, which had renowned healing properties, and they would basically battle witches who had shorgum stocks. So they would clickety-clack their stocks at each other <laughs> in the inner earth, in their astral form. Staff attack. Yeah, staff attacks. And uh, some researchers believe this is where you get the broomsticks from. There's a lot of other reasons to suggest that, but the stock thing, there's a connection there. So for up to several hours, they would be whooshing at each other with these sticks. These opposing spirit armies engage in this battle, beating each other with these stocks. If the Benendati won, the year's crops would be abundant. If the witches won, storms would plague the growing and harvesting seasons, and famine would ensue. After the games, which is what they were called, interestingly, the Benendati and the witches passed by houses looking for clean water to drink. If they found none, the witches entered the cellars and either overturned the wine casks or drank the wine and urinated in the casks. Because oh, that's what you do after you drink the wine. Oh, right? Very nice. Pretty gross. Um, now, John, this is part I wanted you to pay attention to because uh, this is this will sound familiar in conversations we've had on the show about your own personal experiences, not as a call, uh, cult member with a fetal tissue around your neck, but for other reasons. The spirits had to return to their bodies by cock's crow. If they did not, or if their bodies had been turned over onto their stomachs while the spirits were gone, they either had great difficulty re-entering their body or could not get back in at all. And the spirits then were forced to wander the earth until their body's destined time of death arrived. About like, uh, yeah, it's so fascinating. if you sleep on your back, you have these horrible dreams. And also the nightmare, the nightmare, the, uh, the old hag sitting on the chest. Mm -hmm. and the idea of things coming through your solar plexus, the possession. Yeah, that's interesting that you can get back in your body as long as you're laying on your back. Yeah. If you're astral projecting, but if you're laying on your stomach, it's closed off to you. It's just a weird... Right. Well, most out-of-body experiences are reported when people are laying on their back. 
there's that feeling of the pull often from the chest, the solar mm-hmm. plexus, or occasionally just, out the top of the head. Right. Just interesting connection. I thought that was interesting. You know, what's weird about that is a lot lately I've been waking up on my back. Like I always go to sleep on my side and I'll wake up every hour and a half and I'll be on my back and I'll just be like, how did that happen? Well, you know, just it's over and over again. But I haven't been having nightmares, but I've always have really weird dreams. And I was going to say you've had your first uh, lucid dream oh, right, recently. Yeah. And I wonder if that has, uh, plays a role in it. Because when I had my OBE experience, that I had two weeks of extreme lucid dreams. We did like every night, lucid, intense lucid dreams before that experience. And then they went away for a while. But I'm wondering if like, you know, I, I'm just throwing this out there, but your lucid dream. And now you're saying that you're finding yourself on your back a lot. Maybe there's something going on. It feels like I'm being pulled yeah. mm-hmm. to my back. Because I'm certainly subconsciously and consciously not wanting to be on my back and to constantly be happen over and over again. And just, I almost, I've thought about putting a camera up, but that freaks me out. <laughs> oh, like, yeah. see if like something is pulling I just you over. don't want to see myself. <laughs> Hank, I just think that's such a creepy Lanky thing. Hank is like slowly moving you, <laughs> <laughs> rolling you in bed. That's such a weird, I wonder what the mechanism scientifically is. This is slightly off topic, but. No, go for it. What makes you forget your dreams so fast? Yeah, you know, that's a good because we've covered sleep phenomena before, but I don't know if we've ever touched on that exact thing. Like, why? Yeah, why does that fade? Why does it just immediately fade? Yeah. Why do you wake up and like while you're dreaming, you have these like, it's, it's such a feeling, and a, you can see all these things, and then as soon as you wake up, it's like it just like sand through saturation drops through your hands. It just yeah yeah it just it's almost like you're so quickly you're programmed yeah it to seems forget. almost like yeah like it's a you're not allowed to remember exactly Let's look it up it's the sleep secrets. Yeah, slightly off topic, but it's kind of interesting. Yeah, definitely. Well, if you think there's something to the reality of the dream state, there's something to that that maybe you're not supposed to know. Kind of like when people have near-death experiences and there's certain things that they know they're not allowed to bring back. Yeah. Oh, this is interesting. This is the the potential scientific rational explanation. Can I guess before you say it? Go for it. It could be rational and potentially another. Oh, for sure. Is it, I was thinking potentially the rational uh, idea would be that your brain just can't, keep the concept of two it's not really a rational idea but like it's your subconscious recording it so then you don't have the conscious oh, okay memory. i was thinking more i guess not rationally but i was thinking like if there is an alternate reality that we live in dreams oh. <laughs> that when we when we w- uh, move into this reality in order to acclimate to this reality as you know in a natural you can't way hold two realities you in can't, your mind you can't exist you well, think exist about when you're places. dreaming you're not thinking about the reality of this place exactly at all. that's why yeah. dreams can make sense while you're there yeah. even though you look back you at don't, that, in no your sense. dream you're not thinking about oh i live at seven five six you know unless your right. dream is hubert lane unless your dream is very oriented around your waking life which i've had those two right. but there's always still I something mean, that's different yeah or, i mean it's very it's interpretation. rare that you're just like oh i'm eating breakfast this morning in my house yeah. and my dog's there and we're just eat you know it's like it's always way more bizarre than that right it's like that anteater's combing my foot while i'm eating cereal unless you're a really boring person can you imagine if you just dreamt the same exact like <laughs> dreams as you have during the day there's like one guy listening and i was like oh that's me have you ever had the dream of being bored out of your mind? <laughs> no. no. You've what? never had what? that dream? Dreamt of being bored? Yes. I've had a, a few times in my life. That's nuts. Probably at least I can, 10 times that I can count what? on those It's kind of like you're stuck in a... Yeah, you're stuck in a loop of boredom. You're like, God, will this end? It's like the most boring, tedious... <laughs> I've never heard of that. You've never heard no. of that? I've had dreams like that remind me of that, like being trapped, like in a cell or underground where you, you can't do oh, anything. It's not like that intense, but... Like I'm stuck at work and it's just yeah, going I've, so slow. I've had dreams that I worked all night, like either editing or when you know, or younger days, like I was dishwashing all day and then I woke up and I was exhausted because my whole dream was just yeah, me working the whole time. Right. But I've never been like, what do I do? It's well, that's boring. kind of the, I mean, it's similar to that. We hope you're not bored out there with our dream conversation, but <laughs> dream talk. I think we it's should pretty say, interesting. Actually, we'll do this after because I don't want to interrupt the story too much. But speaking of dreams, you should tell about your dream after the story. Yeah, we'll save it by the, the end. Witch's dream. Yeah, because it's fascinating. Oh, the, but this is the rational explanation I just came upon real quick on Google. National Institute of Health, quote, this is one possible explanation. No one knows is the key. Quote, since dreams... Neil deGrasse Tyson knows. Well, he, he, <laughs> he thinks he knows everything. Quote, since dreams are thought to primarily occur during REM sleep, the sleep stage when the MHC cells turn on, activation of these cells may prevent the content of a dream from being stored in the hippocampus. Consequently, the dream is quickly forgotten. So basically, these cells activate, and for some reason, the hippocampus can't record what is being thought with the subconscious nonsense. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah. There's, I don't no, even believe there's, in a there's no way that I could possibly <laughs> understand if that's accurate or not. Right. <laughs> but I think we all know the reality is that it is an alternate reality that we yeah. visit every time we go to bed. Absolutely. And the hippocampus does not allow it. I don't even believe there's such thing as hippocampus. 
<laughs> I don't believe in brains. Lies. The frontal cortex is a liar. <laughs> All right. Shall we uh, continue this strange tale? Yes. Of the Ben and Dottie. I don't know. I think this is a fascinating. You guys enjoying this yeah. so far? Okay. Pretty good, Chris. Thank you. You're deeming yourself. Should have done this one first. And I left off on, I thought you, the guy with the staff was colorful, but maybe you got to read it. Just focus on the staff stories. Okay. Next time. There's no more next time for a lot of people that tuned out. They loved it. Uh, <laughs> anyway, so yes, the astral connection, I thought that was fascinating, especially considering the time period. And kind of interestingly, the Ben and Dottie, that cult, the origins of the cult are unknown. People don't know who formed the cult, how it became a thing. They just know that in this time in Italy, there were these people born with the cult and they would all claim to be the Ben and Dottie, who would secretly battle witches in the inner earth. Uh, is it the inner earth or the center, the center of, of the, the world? world? Center of the earth. Is it world or earth? It says center of the world in a, what was it, the Josephat Valley? Valley of, of Joseph. So it could just mean like in could the middle. It could be more of a metaphysical, yeah. Or just in the middle of the land. The center of the world. Anyway, as I said, they considered themselves to be the good guys. And this was kind of the interesting thing, you know, though pagan, the cult had acquired Christian elements by the late 16th century. Uh, because, you know, they believed they were the good guys, uh, they were also a lot of them Christian themselves. Much like you have in the in Appalachia, or even in spiritualist movements where you have people practicing some sort, of, more of a folk tradition, but also believed to be Christian. There's kind of a melding of that. An overlap. Yeah. Um, the Ben and Dottie went out in the service of Christ and God to battle agents of the devil. That was their belief. That's what they were doing. John, will you continue this tale of the Ben and Dottie? The Ben and Dottie came to the attention of the church in 1575, when a priest in Brazano heard rumors of a man in Sivdale, Paolo Gasparuto, who could cure bewitched persons and who, quote, roamed about at night with witches and goblins. Summoned and questioned by the priest, Gasparuto admitted the Ember Day's outings, adding that in addition to fighting, there was leaping about, dancing and riding on animals. To the priest, this sounded ominously like a witch's sabbat, and he involved the Inquisitors. Various interrogations and trials of Benendati were conducted. The church Inquisitors made efforts to associate the Benendati with witches and to get them to confess that they participated in witches' sabbats and that they were forced to abjure Christ and had given their souls to the devil. But with few exceptions, the Benendati staunchly deflected these efforts. They also insisted that being Ben and Dottie did not at all interfere with their regular church going and Christian prayers. They said they were forced to go out in service because they had been born with the call. They were initiated at maturity and after some 10 or 20 years in service were relieved of their obligations. While some Ben and Dottie claimed to go out during each of the embers days, others said they went out only once every few years. Still others said they were called out whenever witches, quote, did evil. Some said they knew who were other Benendati and who were witches, while others said they did not know anyone but recognized the spirit forms as one side or the other. Most protested that they could not reveal names or even details about the battles, lest they be severely beaten in punishment. The Inquisitions, however, often succeeded in eliciting names of members of both factions. Okay, so let's turn back real quick to this sort of spirit travel we were talking about, the astral travel. I thought this was interesting, as I mentioned earlier, how this wasn't such a discussed phenomenon back then, whether it's the church or uh, in occult practices. Astral travel? Yeah, at least not in the same terms, at least not to this vivid description. You have, of course, shamanism and, you know, Lapland, which we'll talk about at the end of the Witch, episode. In witchcraft, I believe it was called sending, when you send out your you yeah. know, spirit to attack. But this, as you'll hear, we'll go on to uh, discuss the reaction of the church hearing about the, these sort of astral travels. One aspect of the Benendati's nocturnal travels that puzzled inquisitors the most was the leaving behind of the body. By the late 16th century, inquisitors and demonologists were beginning to question the actuality of the witch's sabbat, contending instead that it was all hallucinatory. But the Ben and Dotty insisted that their spirit battles were very real, that they did leave the body and travel in spirit and could assume the shape of animals. They did not feel pain in the fighting, they said. Some said they left the body after rubbing on an ointment or oil, while others fell into a faint that resembled a cataleptic state. Beyond that, the peasants were at a loss to explain, 
One description of the spirit traveled to the Valley of Jehoshaphat, offered in 1591 by Menachino de Anota as a dream in order to dodge the Inquisitors, is described in Night Battles by Carlo Ginsberg. So this was his description that he alleged was a dream because he was worried about being persecuted. So he said, no, 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 it was just a dream. But this was his actual description of what he experienced traveling astrally. I had the impression there were many of us together, as though in a haze, but we did not know one another. And it felt as if we moved through the air like smoke, and that we crossed over water like smoke. Everyone returned home as smoke. No inquisitors could accept that the soul could leave the body while it was living and return. That the Benandati took the shapes of animals led the inquisitors to believe that they were physically led off on animals, and they tried to ascertain that the devil did the leading. Okay, and so this is interesting. Until the Inquisition, little had been known about the secret of Ben and Dottie. Even in their own villages, I guess. People just were unaware, unless you were in the know. Some who were known for their healing and spell-breaking abilities were sought out. The public attention, plus the persistent efforts of the church to ally the Ben and Dottie with witches, eventually did lead to increasing association of the Ben and Dottie with witches. By 1623, the church had obtained confessions from Ben and Dottie that they participated in witches' Sabbath. So this is starting to get a little worrisome for the Ben and Dottie, right? This led to more damning confessions of devil's packs, desecration of the cross, vampirism, mm. to abjuration of the Christian faith. What had once been a purely agricultural rite became transformed into a rite of devil worship. But there's a bright side, even after all this, all this conflation to sort of damn these good doers as they believed, there's a bright side. Despite its success, the church put little effort into persecuting the Ben and Dottie. Many trials were never concluded, and torture was not used. Punishment, when meted out, was mild. Prison sentences or banishment. A few scattered inquisitional efforts occurred into the late 1600s, but trials were abandoned. So, that's kind of a happy ending for the Ben and Dottie. What if there's any Ben and Dottie left? Could be. You know? I mean, if you're in Italy and you're born of the call, I guess you could maybe be Ben and Dottie. From a long line of, you know, astral witch fighters. Yeah. Very interesting story, though. The idea that this group of people, I guess chosen ones had just been around you know might be laying above you in the apartment above you and this italian village <laughs> fighting witches at night and never knowing until the inquisition comes along and starts you know pointing them out and their story comes out and they become accused of witches right yeah interesting i mean i i just think the astral connection is fascinating the out-of-body experience in this context is interesting so yeah the first the earliest example i've heard is specifically of uh kind of pointing out the concept of the exposure of the solar plexus uh, and with the connection of the other side or yeah. the, you know, the astral ether, etc. And speaking of metamorphosis into animals, this is the last thing I have before Jeremy tells his dream story to put everyone to sleep. <laughs> dream story. I think we mentioned this on the before on the show, but the three of us brothers descend from a long line of Nordic folk, uh, and specifically the Laplanders, uh, or the Sami people, who believed in shamanism, who had Sami shamans. And so I just want to touch on that because this is kind of a, a cool time to do it because we've talked about metamorphosis in this episode. We've talked about sending yeah. out of your body. And since this is our heritage, and it's funny, John, the, the, <laughs> I'll show you the picture. A lot of the Sammy people in these old pictures look like someone from the Berg family. They look like they could be like, I don't know. Look at the features here. Isn't that weird? Yeah, it definitely kind of almost looks like a mix between grandma and grandpa. I know. That's what I was thinking. Yeah, we didn't know that until like what last year that we were. Uh, Grandma had mentioned Laplander a lot. Yeah, and well, which apparently some consider that derogatory. Laplander. Yeah, I don't get how. I mean, you I know. think it's just not like the technically correct. I mean, term. if Grammy used it, I think it's fine because she was descended from so it's Sammy people, but they're from Lapland, which is yeah. like a quarter of all Scandinavia. I think it's like northern Sweden. Yeah, the upper Norway. areas. Yeah. Any uh, Sammy people out there listening, chime in. And I just had this quick little fun thing about uh, the Sammy. Um, and I'll have, by the way, we'll have links to all of these uh, resources in the show notes on our website. Click full show notes in the show notes on the app you've got. The native Sami of northern Fresno, Scandinavia are a very spiritually connected culture of people that have historically practiced ancient shamanistic rituals as an essential part of their daily lives. The Sami shaman, or Noidi, was a spiritual guide and mediator of the Sami Sita, or village collective. He had the ability to travel through the three realms of spiritual reality in which the Sami believed. This is really cool. During a trance state, his purposes 
For contacting the other realms were many, finding game and performing hunting-related rituals, foretelling the future or divination, uncovering secrets. So if you got your, you got a secret, you, you know, you want to find out about your neighbor, go to the Sammy Shaman. <laughs> Bad advice. Also healing, uh, bestowing good fortune, bad fortune, manipulating the weather, providing protection from a hostile shaman, and communicating or meeting, this is freaky but cool, with the dead. So you obviously you go to a shaman, a lot of cultures, to communicate with the dead. This was their role. Um, the spirits of nature, gods, and the unseen worlds. Anyway... I just wanted to share that because I've always wanted to talk about that a little bit. So I just, I looked into it and shared it. It'd be a cool episode to like actually look into some of the beliefs of the Sami people yeah. and some of the, the legends and lore. And again, it connects to that sending out. Anyway, before we call it a day, Jeremy, why don't you tell us about your dream? I did have a weird dream and it involves witches. Yes. Spoiler alert. I don't even know if we decided to do the witch episode yet. Mm -mm. We are staying at a local haunted home uh, that is an Airbnb. Uh, the pink house. The pink house. And essentially, yeah, it has a history for being haunted. So I guess that kind of was in my mind already, but not witches. Why would I be thinking about witches? It was an, a doctor that lived there. There's a really cool photograph of this doctor on the old cobblestone bridge riding his carriage from like early 1800s, I think, mm -hmm. doing his rounds. So apparently the house was haunted allegedly by the spirits of children. <laughs> Yeah. Which is interesting because Chris, you said <laughs> we didn't know that uh, yeah. before, but apparently we had opened this little crawl space. The one creepy, I think, room in the house is this like attic crawl space at the top floor, and this little tiny children-sized door that opens up to it. And there were little human footprints, barefoot, in the dust. Yeah, that was what weirded me out. They were bare feet. Yeah, I just kind of you know blew that off. It's also kind of weirded me out was that the lock is on the outside. So you close this little door to the attic and then you lock it from the outside. A lot mm -hmm. of those doors were like that. I think maybe because doors were... No, it's ghosts. <laughs> it's <laughs> ghosts trying to get out. Need to be locked in. It's also interesting because we had a listener send in uh, a couple years ago a story. I've been trying to save it till we ever do a, a hometown episode, uh, but of a story basically about being right next to that house in between the coffee shop and that house and having an experience seeing a little ghost girl that vanished before our eyes. Which was weird because that's before I knew that that place was even allegedly haunted, especially by oh, yeah. the ghosts of children. So definitely interesting. But yeah, what happened in your dream with the witches? So I, I snuggled up, got cozy, a little sleepy, and I drifted off. And yeah, my dream was so strange because it was one of those dreams where you are exactly where you were when you fell asleep. Well, I wasn't in bed. I didn't wake up in bed, I, but I woke up in the house. And I was, I can't remember what happened at the very beginning, but I know I was in the house. And well, the first thing I can remember, the earliest part of the dream, is walking up the old, very creaky steps of the house. But I'm there with some other person uh, that I knew in the dream, but I can't remember who it was. And then I was being guided up the stairs, or we were, by these two older witches. Just women that practiced witchery, if you will. Witchcraft. And it was definitely like this was in the past. Oh, okay. Yeah. It wasn't like someone, you know, visiting from the witch shop down the street. It was people who had, were practicing and it lived in the house in my dream. And uh, I just remember going up the steps and at one point hearing this like knocking around in the this room with the closed door behind it. I could hear like fumbling. Where the children's footprints were? No, 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 no. This was a separate room. Okay. It was something like a bedroom, but it sounded like wood floors very hollow with this like fumbling about and falling over. It sounded like dogs and the witch ladies informed me that that door doesn't open and no one lives in that room, but those are the spirits of the dogs that live here that we're fumbling about. Um, just very, very weird. It was one of the, it just felt so real. And then from there, it moved on to like, at some point I'm outside and there's a weird hill that we're climbing over to become witches initiation <laughs> or something. And someone was selling a weird teapot with two spouts. I don't know. Weird, you know, weird little details. Jeremy, are you, are you secretly a witch? <laughs> I may have been in a past life. Or a warlock? A he witch, if you will. Mm. A man witch. Do the witches seem evil? Uh, or just more like informative? They, yeah, they were informative. Uh, they seemed strict, but it seemed like they were hiding a piece of themselves. Mm. There could have been a darkness mm. there. Alter your motive. Yeah. I think it's a lot like a lot of old school magic and, and uh, folk magic and the like where it can be good or bad. And the sense I got from them in the dream was basically like, you know, well, what do we want to have done? Yeah. We, we do good or bad. That kind of thing. Like a neutral gray where you could practice black or white kind of thing. Whatever's practical for the person purchasing the craft, if you will. Kind of like It. Yes! <laughs> yes! <laughs> like Speaking it. of which, there's a new It coming out. 
Yeah. Is it going to be good? I hope so. I hope so too. Fingers crossed. I don't know. The new uh, movies I thought were really good. Yeah, I did like this. The latest, the last two? Yeah. Oh yeah. I thought they were spectacular. Yeah. I liked them a lot. I actually want to see the second one again. Yeah. You were talking about that. The sewer scene with the... Uh, oh, Bill Hader. With Richie. Yeah. When he sees the deadlights. Yeah. yeah. Such a good scene. It was really good. I I don't think I totally absorbed it when I saw it in theaters. It was a long movie too. Wasn't it like yeah. two and a half hours? It's mm-hmm. very long. But well done, I thought. I liked it because it closely matched the book in a lot of ways that the first, which I love, my favorite is obviously the miniseries with um, Tim Allen. No, Tim Allen. <laughs> 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 Tim Curry. <laughs> I just skipped my brain. Anyway, uh, I hope you guys liked. Well, we're not done with okay, the conversation yet. That was a terrible Tim Allen impression, by the way. <laughs> what I love about it is it's just like our show. It's, you know, we have like the stories. Uh-huh. And those are like, you kind of go into that story mode. That's kind of how it, it is too. <laughs> it's like, what? It, either, you know, that like, you know, when like there's a scene when oh, it right. comes and it, yeah. it's like a special part of the movie. That's it's a like good point. The it encounters, you know, it becomes like, like an app, the atmosphere changes. Yeah, and, right. Yeah, it just point. pulls you into that moment and then, you know, it ends and then another one comes that's back. That's a good and, point, John. I like that. Yeah. Yeah. I like that movie. You also liked, uh, <laughs> you like, I guess since it's the end of the episode, we could just talk movies a little bit if we want to. It is the scary season. I thought it would be cool and we're not going to do that this year, but maybe eventually as we get the video studio and stuff, but you know, we can like in the expansion of stuff, people who want just more content, it would be fun to talk about and review our favorite, like horror movies for Halloween, that kind of stuff. Cause one, yeah, one movie I started watching that you really enjoyed, John, uh, shifting gears into that is uh, evil dead rise. Mm-hmm. It's a good movie. It's pretty cool. It's definitely like dark and gory. Very kind dark. Of. And uh, yeah, it's gory, but I don't really like gory horror movies, but this yeah. one was so cool that it was like tolerable. It was tolerable. Just because of how like we're like such an interesting mood that they made with yeah. the film. Yeah, and, they did a great job with the, with the setting too. I don't want to spoil like what happens and how they get kind of trapped in this situation, but it was very clever the way they did that and it was unique. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Was Sam Raimi involved in this? Cause I know they do the same shots that they did from like, you know, the Bruce Campbell films yeah I, f- I thought he directed this one too i don't know because i don't know if he was part of the the remake evil dead i don't know if he was involved in that i can't remember this one definitely was like probably the most extreme yeah oh for 100 all of them as far as like they took it to the the gore you know because like the original evil dead it's like it's campy too yeah you know even with the newer ones it's still kind of like it has a campiness kinda almost like comedy but this one like pushed that line between you know, you didn't laugh. Yeah, it was campy in a way, but it was like so extreme. It was that more campy, it was unsettling. demonically campy. Yeah, unsettling. Very unsettling. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, but yeah, very worth a watch it's if well you done. can handle the gore. Yeah, don't eat dinner. Yeah, there will be intestines and things like that, eyeballs and such. Yes, <laughs> <laughs> or the losing of them. Anyway, yeah. What about the Boogeyman? I haven't oh, seen it yet. Yeah, dude, it's a great movie. Yeah, Boogeyman. The way that they shot that and showed. Especially in the beginning, like eventually you see more of it, but it's still cool. But the way it's done in the beginning is like you get hints in, in like quick shots of this thing. Uh, and it's almost canine-esque. Like oh, without really? giving too much away, it has this like wolf feel to it. You Interesting. Know, this predator, um, but something so sinister and, and off and evil. What I loved about the Boogeyman and also about the, even though I, there were aspects of the show that I didn't enjoy as much, but it's the same. Both come from show? Outsider. Stephen King, Stephen King HBO series. I haven't seen it's it. It's based on it. the same kind of idea. You'd mm. like that, John. The Boogeyman is? Yeah. Yeah, that's it's just based, based on a short, short story. story. Oh, okay. But what I love about Jinx. it, when that show, the HBO show came out, we had just done our Boogeyman episodes. Remember that like two-parter? Mm-hmm. And uh, that episode, it was just such a synchronicity, like a real, felt like a real synchronicity. Oh, because, that's right. I remember that. So King, you know, it was King's story, but he talked about all the same cultural Boogeyman entities from around the world and a lot of the same like spiritual architecture stuff that we had pulled up. It was so weird. It was like the universe had listened to our episode and then created an HBO show based off of the Stephen King short story, but it just tied so closely together with almost like the layout of the episode. It was really weird. Well, we had talked about the feeding on grief of the yeah. old green eyes, Chat- mm-hmm. the Chat- Battle of Chattanooga. Yeah. Oh no, Chickamauga, Battle of Chickamauga. And uh, that's like the big part of the concept of the, out- the outsider. Yeah. The grief feeding. Yeah. yeah. Eating the grief and living amongst the gravestones yeah. and but you would love that show. It's, it's very moody. It's a really good atmospheric program. What was it called again? I think it's The Outsider. Mm. But back to The Boogeyman. But the so Boogeyman. I think you kind of said what it was. Like, Yeah. I don't want to say exactly too what... Too much more. Yeah. Definitely, but, um, definitely a good movie, though. And it, the, one of the best parts, of course, is that like the whole point of The Boogeyman is no one believes you, especially the kids. Mm-hmm. And then 
you know, that's the problem of not believing is you're not prepared for when it's real. That's kind of like the feeling of it. Good catchphrase. Really, really good. It's not the one with Skeet Ulrich uh, from like 2008 or something. I forgot about that. I think it was also good, but not not near what this is, obviously. Newer, more serious film. So check it out, guys. We'll put links in the show notes. I don't know. (laughs) You can Google them. Um, or if you're watching on YouTube, we'll probably be a little preview playing for you. So watch Maybe on YouTube, we'll guys. We'll talk more about the uh, scary movies when we get a chance at the end. Maybe we'll review it. <gasps> That'd be fun. Dairy. It's called, what's it? it? Oh, the new series? Welcome to Dairy is what it's called. Oh, Welcome to Dairy. Yeah. Not to be confused with uh, Dairy, which is a really good show. Oh, it's a good Irish comedy coming of age in the 90s. Girls in Ireland. Dairy, Ireland. In the yeah. 90s. Mm. Great show. Good comedy. Oh, hey, guys. Did you want to do that special little Halloween treat? We're going to let you pull out a little piece of chocolate from last year. Last season's Halloween, in the expansion, we did an episode called 3.15 Expansion, Witchcraft, Magic, and Dark Charms of the Occult. And I figured, you know, since it's also a witchy episode, we could give a little special treat from that episode and inject it here so you guys can get a little taste, those of you who haven't joined the expansion yet or haven't found that episode. It's a little grab bag of just random uh, mysterious artifacts and uh, witchy lore and history for you, so... Pleased to enjoy that here. But let's get into something right off the bat that we can do that's a little little juicy. Let's juice it up. Even though we're a little after the bat. But, ooh, is that a Halloween pun? Sure. Cue bat sounds. <laughs> okay, we're off to a rocking good start, huh? Oh my god, I'm having fun. <laughs> so in the spirit of Halloween and grabbing treats from bags, or carved pumpkins, plastic pumpkins, right? Things you grab from. We're going gra- to do a grab bag of witchy words terms and people kind of i guess i don't know this is research basically i compiled from different areas about this topic that i just thought were kind of interesting anecdotes for instance abracadabra Mm -hmm. it's interesting i thought that was just a made-up word right i thought that it was like kind of a disney invention yeah that's what i would think you were wrong i am i yes you are this goes back to well it was popularized or most popular that we know of in medieval times Essentially a magical spell, as you would guess. I would guess. Consisting of a single word, either to get rid of illness, misfortune, you know, that whole deal. Uh, Usually inscribed on amulets. Who came up with it? Written on a piece of paper. That's what's crazy is no one knows. Probably John Abracadabra. The word's origin is unknown. Really? And this is interesting. So it's said by some to have been invented around 208. Like AD? BC or AD? You know, it left off that part. I mean, it's not too far away. It was like 400 year difference. By Quintus Serranus Samonicus, is a physician to the royal emperor Severus, who you guys are all very familiar with. Oh, yeah, yeah. As a cure for fever, some hold that Samonicus merely borrowed a formula that was much older. According to others, the word comes from the old Arabic phrase, now this might sound familiar, Abada Kadabara. Oh, yeah. Right? Mm-hmm. Probably going back to there. What is that? How does that sound familiar to anything? Because it sounds like abracadabra. Say it again. Abada Kadabra. I don't see Abada the Kadabra. connection. Okay, I see what you're <laughs> see doing. the connection. Real troll over here. It reminds here. me of um, I'm a troll. Agrabah, which you've been saying a lot today for some reason. I think it's been in my head. Alibaba. Mm-hmm. Anyway, so apparently that word seems to go back to much, much older times. It's Aramaic. So I thought that was interesting. Uh, also said to be derived from the name Abraxas, the Gnostic god who appears on charms against the evil eye. Ah, the evil eye. I know the evil eye. Which dates from the second century. Another possibility is that it is the name of some long forgotten demon. Because you know, with a quit saying it, to have power over a demon, you have to know its name. That's the idea. True story. You know the demon's name, then you have control over it. Azazel. There you go. You got him already. Mm -hmm. That's got him in the bag. You could write your own grimoire, sir. He's a regular Solomon over there. A regular Solomon. Well, you know, that reminds me, Jer. I can interject this real quick if you want. Sure. It reminds me, we kind of said in the beginning, Abermelon, the mage, who we talked about in our Loch Ness episode. Yeah. This is kind of an interesting way to think about how it all works together in the beginning of all of this yeah. uh, magic ritual and rites. And this comes from Guiley's book. Abraham, or Abermelon, created a body of magical works that for centuries influenced magicians, including Aleister Crowley. An expert on the Kabbalah, Abramelin said he learned his magical knowledge from angels who told him how to conjure and tame demons into personal servants and workers and how to raise storms, which is interesting. I haven't looked that up. He said that all things in the world were created by demons who worked under the direction of angels. 
and that each individual had an angel and a demon as familiars. That's, that's interesting and weird. I've right? never heard that before. The, so, hold on, I got one more sentence. The basis, <laughs> the basis of a system of magic, he said, may be found in Kabbalah. So in his works, obviously Crowley derived his rituals from Abermel. Abermel, and likewise, a little bit, so did Gardner, the father of Wicca. Yeah. And yeah, modern witchcraft, capital W. All goes back to Kabbalah. Go ahead. What are you saying, John? Um, you found that interesting? Oh, yeah. the direction of demons building things on earth or creating So everything is created on earth by demons? This is allegedly by Abermel and created by the demon servants of angels. That doesn't make any sense. Well, you think about it. Think about <laughs> think about it. Then it does. does. Think about it. Demons are their arch nemesises. Kind of, but they, think about it. They were the same at one point. Yeah, but now they're the polar opposite of each other, and they wouldn't work in. Well, if you look at biblically, yeah, I'm not buying it. If you look at biblically, demons were used as servants to build the Temple of Solomon. If you believe that tale in the Bible, right? So there is definitely a history and of the that Na- idea. Gnostic Christians Bible bl- schmeibel. <laughs> Strike you down. Hawk! Uh, if you look at Gnostic Christians, for instance, I believe they and some other Christians believe, along with a lot of other spiritual groups, religions, mm-hmm. whatever, that demons were essentially neutral, generally. You know, like the whole pan thing, the Druid uh, elementals. Oh, yeah, where there's sort of, there's a dark and light to either side. They do as they will. They're very dangerous. You shouldn't mess with them. A lot of the grimoire idea, too, is, you know, if you're trying to take control of a demon to do your bidding... It's extremely dangerous. You better not miss. You better not miss. And that's the kind of thing with the grimoire that's really grimoire that's really interesting is that these books of magic. If you've heard of Faustian magic or Faustian mm-hmm. Faustian deals with the devil? Yeah, Faustian deals with the devil. Well, he was a real guy. That's like the quintessential selling your soul to the devil story. It was a play written after him, I believe, which is what we're mostly familiar with, but he had an actual grimoire. But the whole point of the grimoire was not to make a deal with the devil in general. It was to make deals with demons or, or negotiate with demons to put them under your control, essentially. And the grimoire was supposed to help you, basically guide you to be able to trick the demon right. so that you wouldn't end up having to lose your soul or suffering incredibly from making this deal with the demon and helping you whatever you want him to do. Right. The grimoire was supposed to help you figure out how to get around that part of the deal. Yeah, he was an alchemist, astrologer, and magician. I think that was, the character was based off of this guy right. in real life. Tricky. Hit a pack. Tricky stuff. One cool little anecdote that guy was just talking about, Abermelon, you know? Yeah. Allegedly, he created 2,000 spirit cavalrymen for Frederick, Elector of Saxony. Okay. <laughs> Just going to share that with you. Okay. I guess one of the things about this is like, who is Abermel? Like, or when was he from? He was a mage from 1365. 1365. Okay. So we were talking about that. He's obviously pre Crowley, but I didn't know how far he went back. Yeah. That's pretty far. Pre Crowley. PC. PC. Pre Crowley. <laughs> John, there is something called the Hand of Glory. This is one of the things I came across in this encyclopedia that was just fascinating. I'm going to put this picture in the show notes. Boom. Weird. Right? Super creeps. Um, yeah, there's an eye in the middle of the hand, too. Well, in that one, that's kind of a modern representation. It's a candle made to represent the hand of glory. I'm guessing that has to do with witchcraft. Yeah, you would guess correctly. So the hand of glory was this crazy tool, essentially, that one could use to rob someone burglarize their home and keep them from waking up. Magical tool. Now you would take this thing up to a, a place you'd want to rob and then you'd light all the candles. Mm-hmm. Which were the fingers. Let's just read it. Does it work? Yeah, every time. I brought one. <laughs> That's pretty creepy considering how you acquire it. Went down to the neighborhood gallows. So the hand of glory is a severed hand of a hanged man. Yeah, it's the hand of a criminal, which is why the lore was that you could use it Mm -hmm. to do criminal acts like robbing. You magically preserve it and use it in black magic spells or, yeah, to help you aid in your burglary. How do you magically preserve it? Like a magical pickle jar? Well, we'll find out. Magical vinegar? John is about to read a little excerpt here from the Encyclopedia of Witchcraft. The hand of glory was the right hand of a murderer, ideally severed while the corpse still swung from the gallows. Wow or cut during an eclipse of the moon. It was wrapped in a shroud, squeezed of blood, and pickled for two weeks in an earthenware jar with salt, long peppers, and saltpeter. It was then either dried in an oven with vervain, an herb believed to repel demons, or laid out to dry in the sun, preferably during the dog days of August. Once preserved, the hand was fitted with candles between the fingers, 
The candles, called dead man's candles, were made from the murderer's fat, with the wick being made from his hair. That's disturbing. In another method of curing, the hand of glory was bled, dried, and dipped in wax so that the fingers themselves could be lit as candles. With candles or fingers burning, the hand of glory supposedly had the power to freeze people in their footsteps and render them speechless. Burglars lit hands of glory before breaking into a house, confident that the charm would keep the occupants in a deep sleep while they plundered the household. If the thumb refused to burn, it meant someone in the house was awake and could not be charmed. Hmm. According to lore, once a hand of glory was lit, nothing but milk could extinguish it. Milk? As a counter charm, homeowners made ointments from the blood of screech owls, the fat of wild hens, and the bile of black cats, and smeared it on their thresholds. Oh. Hands of glory were linked to the witches during the witch hunt centuries. In 1588, two German women, Nischel and Bessers, who were accused of witchcraft and the exhumation of corpses, admitted they poisoned helpless people after lighting hands of glory to immobilize them. John Fia, who was severely tortured in his witch trial in Scotland in 1590, confessed to using a hand of glory to break into a church where he performed a service to the devil. And here is a little poem, I think from the time, about using one of these hands of glory. Now open, lock, to the dead man's knock. Fly, bolt, and bar, and band, nor move, nor swerve, joint, muscle, or nerve, at the spell of the dead man's hand. Sleep, all who sleep, wake, all who wake, but be as the dead, for the dead man's sake. Well said. That's awesome. Way better than the worms come in and the, or the worms <laughs> crawl in and the worms crawl out. I mean, in your stomach and out your stomach. I snout. do like that, but from you're talking about from scary stories. Oh, yeah. Oh, the poor little babes in the woods. Oh, uh, grandma. <laughs> yeah, so that's a pretty handy little, oh, pun intended, a handy tool to have if you're a criminal. Our world used to be way more interesting. On the black magic criminal market, you could go and get a dead man's hand that was cut off from some criminal and then make wax candles out of it to sneak into an old home in your town. Yeah, now it's skin cream. Now it's skin cream just to slip in quietly. Like, come over here. <laughs> That's what I think of. Why do you think of skin cream? Just because well, hands? In the mall. Uh -huh, when they're trying to rob you? Yeah, when they're, they're like, come on, over here. Oh, I'm I trying see. trying to sell you. Yeah, they're yeah, They're like yeah. merchants in the middle, and they're very pushy. They are. They probably all have dead man's hands to help them sell. He's usually an attractive person. Uh, I mean, I know. That's I, one time I I've, I've gone over it. there as an attractive gal, and she's like, Feel this. I'll put this on your hand. She's oh, a little yeah. hand rub, and you're like, okay, I'll buy If I buy this, we'll date, <laughs> right? That's the deal. It's all subliminal. It's interesting because that counter charm where you smear all that gross stuff on the archway. Oh, the threshold? I wonder how many people actually did the counter. I mean, you'd have to be under some pretty severe threat of robbery. Oh, make, with the blood of wild hens and, and the, the bile, bile of black, black cats. cats and smeared. You must be sure that you're right. getting robbed soon, that you're going to smear some cat bile on yeah. your door. Ugh, poor cats. I know, right? They get the raw end of the stick. Makes me sad. They get it from both sides. They get it because people are scared of witches and witchcraft, so they, they will kill black cats around Halloween. Samhain. Does that happen? Oh, and they'll do it to, apparently to ward off the, uh, or the witches will do it to ward off the- Evil spirits? The usage of the hand of glory. So cats just get a raw deal both ways. Mm-hmm. Interesting. I mean, I've heard of the hand of glory, but I didn't know they would also put candles in between the fingers. Yeah. And I didn't know that it was also used to like paralyze people. I just, I knew that you could sneak into places, but I wonder if it actually works. Only one way to find out, John. I'm not going to be doing that. I know a gallows nearby. Does it work if you use like a fake hand? Or does it need to be? I think it's got to be a real hand. That'd be disturbing to have like a uh, human hand. Yeah. Made with the wicks of the man's hair. And the, yeah. the, the wax the from fat. his fat. That's fat wax. I mean, some get that somewhere? something is going to happen. <laughs> yes, with that. absolutely, dude. Just the amount of like energy oh, yeah. that you're putting into that. Like, even if you don't believe in witchcraft, you're like, you got a dead man's hand with his fat making an extra skin yeah, layer. That's, that's just disturbing. Ugh. Well, guys, hope you enjoyed that clip from the expansion. I know I did. And thank you for being here. Yeah, I hope you guys enjoyed those stories more than my brothers did. 
<laughs> I know. I enjoyed them. I found them fascinating. I thought they were great. I just wanted a little more magic right off the get-go, but you did great, Chris. You pulled it out of your I hat. I didn't know we were jumping straight into bestiality. I thought that'd be a little more like... <laughs> this, this, you'd be warmed up a little bit first. <laughs> bestiality is always a good icebreaker. That'd be a little more lubrication before we got there. All right, all right. We'll see you over in the expansion for excellent werewolf stories. True accounts. Oh, it's going to be fascinating, guys. The werewolf connection with the secret societies, things I'm pulling together from the crazy corner. It's interesting with the secret society bent is kind yeah. of... Yeah. I'm looking forward to hear that. It's going to be fascinating, guys. So check it out. Become a member. Do that by going to bluefall.com and click on the big red join the expansion fill button. Fill your holes with the hole. Absolutely. That's right. How can you fill a hole with a hole? It is That's a, a good conundrum. question. Yeah. But you can hear. This is how you do it. Fill your ear holes with belief hole. There you go. There you go. It's a very full kind of hole. And one final note, everybody. We will be doing thank yous next episode. So if you haven't heard your name read, it is coming. I promise. Coming soon. I promise, 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 promise. Yes. All right, guys, thanks for joining us. We'll see you next time on Believe Hole. Get it? For some strange reason, during Mass that morning at the Quarry Mission Church, Nuestra Senora de la Purissima Concepcion. What the <laughs> hell? Good work on that. <laughs> Is that one name? Yeah, it's uh, uh, Mrs. Nuez, the new, the new lady of the something conception, the pure conception, probably. Yeah. Good work. I did a Spaniard. <laughs> yes, you did. Mm-hmm.